Hello, and thank you for joining NSBA today for our elections wrap-up call. Uh, we want to get to you the information as quickly as we can. We know there's been a, a lot of questions coming in, um, and we're happy that you're here to join us today. Uh, we've got NSBA President and CEO Todd McCracken joining us, um, and we also have Reed Westcott, Senior Director of Government Affairs, who will be talking uh, a little bit more in depth about some of the elections uh, policies and what that means for uh, the incoming session of Congress. We are recording the session. Um, we do request that uh, everybody put, um, if you keep the chat relatively clear. Put your questions into the chat and we will take questions that way. Um, we are expecting quite a few people and so we're we're going to keep all lines muted and we um, encourage you to keep those muted as well. Uh, like I said, put any questions into the chat and we'll get to those toward the end of our session. Um, and um, as as we all know, NSBA is a nonpartisan organization. Um, we're going to be pragmatic and respectful and uh, appreciate everybody doing the same. Um, if there's any rabble rousers, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll help you get onto the rest of your day and, and boot you out of the out of the call, but I don't think that's going to be an issue whatsoever. So uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Todd McCracken. Thank you, Molly, and thank you all for joining us. It's good to see some familiar names and faces here. Uh, thanks for getting on, and we're going to try to give you know an update for as, as best we can about what the election results mean for um, small business issues and policies going forward into the 25, 26 congressional session. Um, you know, a lot's going to change, as you all know. The uh, the Democrats currently control the White House, the Senate, and and the Republicans very narrowly control the House. Uh, and next year we're looking at some big changes as uh, as we see the return of President Trump. This the Senate has already been regained by the Republicans, and it seems likely that the the Republicans will retain control of the House of Representatives, though narrowly. Uh, it's likely to look a lot like it looks now. With they have just they have they can only use lose a few votes on any any given issue to, to maintain control. Um, that's all pretty significant because there's a there's a big a log jam of issues, especially tax issues, that have not been being dealt with, and uh, lots of looming deadlines at the end of 2025 uh, that are really important to small companies. As we as we uh, are set to lose entirely the pass through deduction, the 20 percent pass through deduction, uh, we're set for the individual rates the pass throughs pay is are, are set to go up again. The, the the estate tax exemption that is really important for planning purposes, if nothing else, for small companies as they look to pass businesses on to another generation, uh, it's set to go way back down to a lower level again, uh, and, and a number of other things as well. Uh, so it's a really important and sort of landmark year for small companies. Um, so the changes that we've seen are, are, are going to make most getting those tax cuts renewed um, certainly easier. The 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 53 vote margin that the Republicans have in the in the Senate should enable them to move a, a tax package forward. You know, you all I'm sure hear a lot about you know the filibuster and getting to 60 votes in the Senate on something and how um, they're ne not ever able to move forward because uh, neither party, uh, at least in the last number of years, neither party ever has more than 60 votes. Um, so that's why a, a Procedure called a, a, a reconciliation bill is is super important, and we fully expect there to be um, a reconciliation bill in the next year. All the what that means, I'm not going to get into a lot of technical details about it. Maybe read can a little bit later if folks have questions. Um, but basically, it means that if they so long as they stay within certain rules, uh, uh, and and they've already passed a budget, and they're trying to reconcile their spending and tax plans to that budget um, and they don't increase the deficit outside of a, a certain uh, a, a window of time, um, then they can move a reconciliation bill through the House and Senate and they do not need any, any more than a simple majority in the Senate to pass it. Um, the, the trick is it can only, it can only uh, in, Encompass budgetary issues, and the parliamentary in the Senate gets to decide whether something is germane or not. Uh, so they can't put anything in the world into that bill. Um, but there's often a lot of controversy about what can fit and what can't fit um, because it becomes really important because it's much easier to pass anything if it's in that reconciliation bill. Um, and uh, it, but it also means that since they can't increase the deficit outside this long-term window, that's why we wind up with temporary tax cuts that expire. 
They had paid, they used a reconciliation bill last time. That's why all these things are expiring uh, at the end of 2025. So we fully expect once again, that we're gonna have a bill that may extend some of these things, but they're once again going to, in all likelihood, going to have an expiration date again, set somewhere out in the future. Um, I'll let Reed talk about some of the more de de details about that tax package, because it may not pass just sort of, um, uh, as is, right? They might just not, not just extend the current breaks. That there could be some reforms, some changes, some additions, some deletions uh, from that as we move forward. So we're going to be pretty laser focused on that. Um, but but again, I think in all likelihood the Republicans are going to take the House, uh, and that will make all of that uh, probably easier. It 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 may complicate other issues, and we're working on, on you know funding for the SBA or what that means. Uh, at the same time that um, the president has also talked about starting a commission to really tackle government spending, and some of those programs for the SBA we fully expect could be on the uh, on the on the chopping block for that. So there may be some things we need to figure out um, there as well. Uh, Reed, maybe I'll punt it to you and let you describe sort of some of the tax details a little bit more. And then we want to talk to you about also about what this means on the on the regulatory picture. There's been a lot of issues that have come up in the last uh, couple of years in the Biden administration on a whole range of, especially workplace regulations. So overtime and joint employer, independent contractor, uh, 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 et cetera, uh, uh, non-compete agreements, for instance. Um, and that uh, that landscape is also really likely to change. And some of those things may get reformed or even totally reversed. So I mean, uh, jump in here a little bit and talk about what you think actually is possible on the tax side next year. And then let's talk regs. Yeah, thank you, Todd. I appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. It's great to see so many folks on the line. Uh, we, we appreciate you being here with us today. Um, so just to get into a little bit, uh, we do anticipate that the current environment is going to produce uh, what we view aligning with our priorities as kind of a, a positive environment for uh, tax uh, consideration. We think that many of the priorities that we have had and we've tried to get inserted into things like the uh, bipartisan tax compromise that we saw this year, um, things like 199A are likely to see serious, serious consideration now. So um, we're, we're very, very optimistic that we will get um, some form of extension. We're not sure exactly what the length might be. Um, I've been talking to folks in DC right now. Um, and, and over the past few days, and one of the things that keeps coming up is we're expecting, again, due to that reconciliation process, a short-term fix still. We're thinking somewhere in the range of a five-year fix would probably be optimal. Um, but we are expecting some level of fix for 199, for individual rates, for uh, for all of the different kind of priorities that we have talked about on the tax front here before. Um, so we're, we're looking to hopefully get as close to a clean extension of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act as we can. Um, that would be, I think, optimal given the, the circumstances that we find ourselves in. There will be opportunities for us to make modifications and changes and to kind of tweak some of the provisions in there, uh, potentially insert other things uh, that, that we may that we may find more advantageous than uh, kind of existing TCJA provisions. But right now, it seems like the agenda is TCJA extension. Um, so we, we, are, we are operating in that environment, and hopefully we're going to be able to kind of make sure that uh, whatever changes they do make are responsive to small business interests as well, and that we don't end up in the same place we were in back in 2017, where we were sort of a last-minute addition to a package that was getting ready. Um, we were very fortunate in that we now have a lot of great leaders, both on the Hill um, and downtown, who have been pushing very, very hard to make sure that small business is at the table early. Uh, so we're, we're very, very optimistic about what the, what the tax package uh, will eventually hold. Um, before we get to the regulatory picture, there's, there's one other aspect that we should chat about a little bit, and that is, uh, as is, you know, it, I'm old enough that I remember this used to be a very unusual thing to have a lame duck session in Congress, but now it's be, kind of become the norm. that They come back and do more business after the elections with the current Congress before the new Congress takes charge. Uh, that's going to happen again, but we think it's going to be a relatively limited set of, of issues they will deal with. Um, uh, they already seem to have a, a, a direction in place for spending to push uh, the current uh, uh, ability for, for the government to spend money if, into March of next year, and then and then the, the Republican Congress will take over. Um, uh, but Reed, what else, anything else you see happening uh, this fall before the end of the year that they uh, happen? And specifically, we're going to continue to push for um, a. Uh, uh, 
at least a delay in the implementation of the Corporate Transparency Act. Um, we'll see if they have a stomach for that. But um, Reed, what do you think? Yeah, what I can say is that we were told earlier in the year that we could expect at least some level of procedural movement on a CTA uh, bill at some point in this lame duck session. We're not exactly sure when that's going to get scheduled, how that's going to fall, or, or when we're going to be squeezed in here, but that we were promised that earlier in the year. So we're looking to, to have that have that happen. Um, what I will say is the, the spending bill actually is becoming a little bit more of a complicated situation than we thought it was initially. So given the new makeup of the incoming Congress, um, as well as the, the uh, change in administration, Republicans are now starting to think that it might be wiser for them to kick that uh, funding date into September, that kind of traditional spending season, um, so that President Trump and the incoming Congress can work to enact in the first 100 days of that, of that new administration as many of the priorities uh, from the campaign as is possible. Um, so I think we're going to see a little bit of a back and forth about what that kind of X date is going to look like for funding. Um, I, on the one hand, uh, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of folks who aren't going to be eager on the Democratic side to give that much of a time window to Republicans to kind of enact their policy agenda without having to work through something as complicated as the budget process. However, uh, Democrats are also going to be able to look at that and say, all right, well, we have a little bit more control now than we will in even two months. Why don't we enact spending that is consistent with the levels that we had previously appropriated for as long as we are able to? So. Um, we're, we're sort of in this in this weird situation where we're, we're trying to figure out exactly where everybody falls. We think that some of the conservatives might not want to extend those funding levels just because of the, those, those kind of democratic uh, it, uh, fund, uh, spending levels, excuse me. Um, and we think that some Democrats may want to shorten the window to, to kind of stymie a 100 day agenda. Some may want to extend it just to kind of keep their priorities funded. We're, we're still making making sense of what that looks like. So that's complicated the lame duck a little bit. And I want to say, while we while we anticipated initially that we might get an early consideration of something in, uh, in, in the CTA field uh, during the lame duck, I think we're we're pushing that a little bit further now. And we're we're not we're not exactly sure when that's going to fall now. I think primarily just because we're not sure exactly what form this probable continuing resolution is going to take. Thanks. The other thing while we're talking about budgetary stuff, though, that, that, that I'd like to point out to people is, you know, as is, is, is you're all aware that we have these periodic, you know, fiscal crises that, that crop up, okay, either because they can't spend it, they, they can't pass a spending bill, or they can't agree on uh, whether and how, by how much to increase the debt limit as we continue to borrow money. Um, and and if when there's a prospect of government shutdown, that is, it affects lots of things, but it's especially hard on those of you who may have uh, government contracts because um, the, the the you know the money stops flowing, and also there it's much harder for you to plan for the for the agencies that are doing work with you to plan, um, and that's something that is I'm not going to say that won't happen again, but it does make it less likely when 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 the various uh, Levers of power of the British Army's government are all in the same hands, so they're less likely to want to play politics against each other when when they're when uh, the same party controls uh, House and Senate and the presidency. So we're less likely, I think, to see those those kind of um, deadlines loom and uncertainty happen and not be aware of whether the government's going to stay open or not or lift the credit limit and all that sort of thing. Um, again. With the very narrow uh, margin in the House that, that the Republicans will have, there still could be uh, some room for some just a real handful of members to play some games on that. So we, we can't rule that out, uh, but it does feel um, like we'll be on a little bit more stable path in those regards uh, now. So let's jump uh, to the regulation outlook that I had mentioned before, uh, before we turn to, to some Q&A. Um, Read most of the regulations we think that we have at least a good handle on that are likely to change directions in the next uh, administration are our workforce and union related stuff, right? So what so what are some of those and what what do you think we can expect? Yeah, thanks, Todd. I think you mentioned kind of right at the at the beginning here. We had a few things that were major priorities for us, especially in the labor space. Mm -hmm. um, independent contractor, joint employer, FTC non competes, and then overtime uh, regulations are sort of the major labor rules that we have seen crop up under under the Biden administration that we've been really kind of laser focused on. Um, we expect those of those that, of those that have not been overturned, because uh, at least one of those has been, we do not uh, expect those to continue long into the Trump administration. 
given that many of those are changes that were uh, that were made either to existing Trump uh, first Trump administration rules or are revisions that are, are inconsistent with general Republican kind of uh, economic policy. Uh, so beginning with the independent contractor rule, I think I think folks are familiar with this one. This basically just kind of uh, delineates the rules of exactly who is an independent contractor, who who can be a 1099 versus who is who is uh, who is not. Um, the the changes to this are in effect as of March 11th of this year. Uh, there have been multiple lawsuits filed over this. They're still kind of working their way through the courts. We don't have definitive resolution yet, but currently that new standard is in place, which did make major revisions to uh, to previous Trump administration guidance on on who could be classified as an independent contractor. Um, so we expect that uh, there is a good chance that uh, a Trump DOL will just right click where we'll pull that one right back and we will see a new regulation that more closely aligns to what we've seen before. Um, I think that's that's a net positive for many folks in the small business community. It's going to make it a lot easier for folks to uh, access that pool of, of independent contractors to make sure that you are able to kind of meet your labor needs in a sustainable way. Um, and and we're, we're very, very optimistic that, that will happen uh, relatively early. Uh, next up, we have... The joint employer rule. This was a uh, primarily a uh, a liability issue between, uh, for example, franchisors and franchisees. It, it really kind of tied liability liability concerns together, uh, kind of across across business interests that way. That was actually overturned already. We're not worried about that. That that one has been uh, has been settled in the courts. That that one we're not particularly worried about. We do not think there will be a new initiative to kind of uh, restart that. We think that one is pretty much settled. Um, next up, we do have the FTC non-compete uh, rules. So I'm sure a lot of folks saw this. Basically, FTC issued a uh, a rule that uh, interpreted almost all existing and future non-compete as uh, unenforceable, with the exemption for a few narrow executives who might have access to very specific information. And even those non-competes that were exempted had to already have been on the books. They couldn't be net. Um, this was uh, overturned by a court uh, earlier this year. However, FTC just last month issued uh, a notice that they intend to appeal. Um, and so we'll, we'll see how long that continues. If the FTC uh, continues to push that in the Trump administration, we are not entirely optimistic that they will. We think that they're likely to pull back on that, um, which, again, is, is viewed at least by, by us here in D.C. as kind of a net positive to the small business community. Um, Non-competes are, are a really, really essential way for small businesses to make sure that there is not a, a loss of talent, a loss of IP, a loss of proprietary information to some of the bigger companies that they compete with really helps us protect ourselves from, uh, from getting poached. So um, we're, we're hopeful that that is going to continue and that they'll be able to um, either just pull that back from the FTC side or they'll let that, that court room stand. Um, the final one is the overtime rule. So this made changes to uh, overtime for white collar employees. Um, there's, a, there's a system that's used for the calculation of overtime for these folks. It's a combination of, of, of wages and hours, and, and it's, it's a, a little bit of an arcane system. Um, there have been multiple revisions to this over the years, and the latest one essentially increased the threshold pretty dramatically for who would be eligible for overtime compensation um, for hours worked above uh, standard in, in the work week. Um, the, th this uh, is partially in effect already. So the first stage of this went into effect as of July 1 of this year. Um, the, the second stage is going to be going into effect as of January 1 of next year. Um, while there are ongoing challenges to this, this is another one that's going to be playing out in the courts for a while. We don't anticipate a, a single uh, legal resolution of this in the, in the immediate term, but we think there might be one long term. There is also a very, very good opportunity here for the incoming Trump administration to just revise the standard. Um, we think they are probably pretty likely to do that because, they, again, it just sort of it, it aligns with their uh, long term economic priorities and brings uh, those sort of uh, wage negotiations back into uh, into a sphere that we think is more traditionally uh, Republican than, than not. Um, so we're we're pretty comfortable that of of the four major regulatory uh, labor initiatives that we've seen in the Biden administration that have been a major concern for small businesses and businesses generally, we think that all four of those are either settled or going to be coming back. So um, we are we're pretty confident in that right now. Um, anything else I can cover, Todd? I think it's the main stuff. So, I, you know, for the most part, I think the regulations will, that will wind up being more small business friendly. But, you know, there's I, I think some folks have told me there's an ongoing frustration about the about the going back and forth. Right. So some of these regulations, there was, you know, Obama regulation that got changed by Trump that got changed by Biden. It's not being changed again by Trump. Um, and so every time small companies adjust and uh, uh change the way they do business to comply with the latest regulation that only changes again, which is um, 
even if there's some improvement, sometimes it's frustrating. So we sort of understand that, but that is, that's kind of the reality that we face. So I know we haven't been able to cover the waterfront of every single issue that might happen uh, in our, in our upfront briefing, but maybe we'll uh, turn out a little bit of Q and A and see what's on, uh, on all of your minds. So if there's anything we can answer. Uh, yeah, I, ball here. I do want to encourage people to get your questions into the chat. Um, I, a couple of people have emailed me, so I do have a couple of questions that we can do yeah. that. So if you prefer to email me, if you'd like to ask your questions anonymously, that's perfectly okay. It's mday at nsbaadvocate.org, and you can send those into me now, and I'm, I'm tracking my email. Um, or you can put them in the chat, whatever's easier. So we'll go with the first question. Um, are there any small business programs that could be on the chopping block, such as various SBA lending programs? And do you think there will be greater support of the Office of Advocacy in getting a chief counsel? Also confirmed. John, do you want me to take this one? No, I actually, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Then you can just sort of chime in. I, I think uh, the answer to both probably is yes. <laughs> um, I, th I do think uh, you know, as most of you are probably aware, the, the, the uh, president has promised a, a government spending task force review, uh, and uh, as you all probably know, almost every time there is such a thing, the SBA rises up on the list of areas that can be that uh, that that can be cut so i think lending programs and some of the other entrepreneurial assistance programs will get a very close look at that and those are things we will need to make sure um are efficient and that we can defend on the chief counsel for advocacy i i do think it is likely we will see a nominee again um uh we are you know, hopeful that the Senate will <laughs> confirm such a person. We have not had a confirmed uh, chief counsel for advocacy at the SBA since the Obama administration. Uh, so it's a significant uh, lapse of time. Um, and, uh, uh, but we shall see. I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic on that one this time than we have been, than I have been for quite some time. Um, but Reed, anything else you want to add to that? Nope, I think you pretty much hit it there. I think uh, one thing that might be worth talking about a little bit is specifically the, the 8A changes that we saw um, this past year, I think are likely to come up. Um, it, it's yep. going to be in the crosshairs for a lot of Republicans. They yep. already talked, they had extensive hearings about their issues with the changes to that program. I think that will definitely be something that they're looking to make modifications to. Um, and again, on the chief counsel front, uh, so President Trump in his first right. term did, was the last president to actually nominate uh, someone for the role. They were not confirmed, but there was a nomination there. Yeah. And I think consistent with that previous uh, Trump administration, two in one out regulatory policy, they're going to be looking to kind of beef up regulatory watchdogs, make sure there's not mm -hmm. too much of a burden coming in. So we're, yeah. we're cautiously optimistic we'll see some change there. Yeah. I will also add that uh, the SBA administrator in, in uh, the first Trump presidency was Linda McMahon, um, who we had a pretty good relationship with. And I do think that Linda... Um, understood the importance of some of the program pretty well. Um, and I think it probably will be something of an advocate for us in this process would be my guess. She currently is co-chair of the Trump's transition team. Um, and um, I, I hear she's in line probably to be Secretary of Commerce. But anyway, Whatever role she lands in, I think she's likely to have a significant voice in in uh, programmatic uh, issues around the, for business, small business especially. Um, so if we can if we can continue to cultivate that relationship, she may be uh, helpful to us as we as we work on some of these programs uh, in the next year or two. Great. Um, again, any any questions you have, feel free to put in the chat. Um, the next question I have emailed was, do you think members of Congress will be open to small business input or will it be a general business focus? Specifically, how do we make sure the small business voice isn't lost or swallowed up by big business? Well, that's... I, that challenge is not new. That's 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 our that's our daily work here <laughs> in in Washington, advocating for small companies, um, because that obviously is the impulse. The, the very large companies um, uh, have armies of lobbyists in this town, uh, and they understand the incentives to put a small business face on all of their issues and try to claim something that you know they might we not, might not even object to, but they claim it's a big small business priority when it's not. Uh, and members of Congress may believe they're doing good stuff for small companies when they're not really moving forward with the real small business agenda. That's uh, the the crux of our of our of our work here to try to reverse that, to address that, to make sure that members of Congress understand what the real small business concerns are 
what the real priorities should be and, and how to address them. So um, really, there's no secret sauce to that, though. It's 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 continuing the drumbeat, making sure all of you are educated on those things, that you can point out when folks are, are on the wrong path, and, and that we do too, and we get other organizations to do the same thing. And don't get misled into very stray, um, random, maybe not terribly important issues uh, because someone has paid a PR firm to put a small business base on it. Yeah, completely agree. That cohesion is critical. Um, if, if folks want to take some optimism from, from the, the administration as well, one thing to look at is the vice president-elect has been, uh, for a Republican at least, significantly more uh, wary, shall we say, of large corporate interests and large corporate activity. Um, so we may have a little bit of a, a, a better opportunity to bend the year of the incoming vice president than we have uh, with previous Republican administrations. I will add too. I, I think something that's really important that NSBA does, and we have for for decades, is um, help set the agenda. And you can join us in February in Washington D.C. for our Small Business Congress. It's a really great event. We have lots of Hill staff, members of Congress, um, regulatory folks come in and talk to our group. And then we, and when I say we, I mean you, um, vote on what the priority issues are going to be for the next two years. And so that's a really great way to to have your voice heard and make sure that you're part of the process and coming up with these um, priority issues. And so I'm going to put a, a link in the chat for that. So if you haven't registered, definitely register soon for that. Um, I do want to kick it over to Ian Elson back. I know he's gotten a couple of uh, questions uh, through the job form. So Ian, do you want to go with those? Yeah, thank you, Molly. Um, again, we do have a few questions in the job form, but we could always use more. So if you'd like to uh, submit an anonymous question, you can feel free to do so through the link in the chat. Um, our first question here, though, from our job form uh, is in regard to reaching across the aisle. Um, this member asks, or excuse me, states rather, uh, can, uh, Congress has, has been historically bad at cooperating across the aisle this past year. Can we expect this to get any better in 2025? I think there are opportunities for there to be some bipartisan issues, but fundamentally, I, my view is no. I don't, I don't, we need to see a realignment of political um, incentives, I think, for that to happen in a meaningful way. Right now, neither party really has a significant incentive to uh, to want to reach across the aisle and and work on issues jointly, um, which is too bad uh, in so many ways, but especially for the small business community, because we're among the few constituencies that both parties um, say they want to support. And so it stands to reason that if we could have more bi bipartisanship, there are more things that could get done specifically to help small firms uh, move forward. Um, so the partisan gridlock is, is, I think, is a huge, huge problem for um, the small business community, especially for those reasons. Yeah, I agree. I think that's going to be a fixture of, of 2025 and the 119th Congress. Um, if, if we want to look for a bright spot in this, one thing that we could say is that uh, given the the kind of postmortem analysis that a lot of uh, Democrats are going to be doing, given the the uh, results of the election, um, there may be opportunities for uh, Democrats to kind of proactively reach out to Republicans, try to find some common ground to insert some level of Democratic priority into moving Republican legislation. So we've already seen folks like I believe it was Senator Chris Murphy has has kind of had a long um, public uh, uh, think about this and kind of put things out on on X, formerly Twitter. Um, to folks that they kind of see. I think there's been a lot of that from folks. And there may be opportunities where Democrats are going to try to say, hey, we need to rethink how we're approaching X issue. If we frame it this way, we might be able to get some Republican buy-in and incorporate it into whatever they're moving as part of the reconciliation that Todd mentioned before or, or any of those things that are going. So that there are going to be opportunities. It's just, I think, the broad tenor is going to be. Yeah, thank you, Reed. And as a follow-up question, is there anything that we can do um, as members of the NSBA or the Leadership Council um, to try to incentivize our members of Congress to cooperate, uh, at least on small business issues, a little bit better? I think I think it really is to just continue to talk to them about missed opportunities um, and highlight that to them and to the larger public back home, because that's Fundamentally, what's happening in society is uh, the the political incentives uh, are driving folks apart rather than together. 
Um, and so they have to see some political benefit to working with the other side. And that means citizens, often small business owners, trying to hold their feet to the fire and pointing out when they had opportunities they didn't take um, and, and and maybe doing that in a, in a public way. Um, that may not make you popular in a, in a given moment, uh, but it may be what's necessary to change that dynamic. Yeah, thank you, Todd. And, and thank you again for the question. Molly, do you mind if I share a couple additional questions or do you have a, a follow-up? I, I do have one more, Ian. So let me um, run with that really quick because it was mentioned in the chat as well. And that's the CTA. I know that's a bit outside the scope of the elections, but um, I've gotten a couple of questions about, uh, you know, I, I was not a member on March 1st, so I went ahead and filed a report. What right. if the ruling comes out and then I didn't have to file the report? What happens to that information, A? And B, can you give us a quick status update on on what's happening with the lawsuit and when do we expect to hear something? Uh, absolutely. Our lawsuit, uh, as you know, we won as of March 1st. Um, it was appealed by uh, the government. Uh, we had oral arguments in that appeal uh, in September, end of September, and we expect a ruling hopefully by mid-December. It really is up to the court. We don't know when that ruling will come. Um, I should say, no matter which way it goes, it's very likely to be appealed further to the Supreme Court um, next year. So even then, the issue wouldn't be fully, finally settled um, at this point. So uh, it, I, I know that puts folks who are trying to figure out how, whether, whether to file, when to file, and in, 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 in a tight spot. And it's also worth mentioning that the NSBA exemption for folks who are members as of March 1st um, uh, is is in effect. FinCEN, who's the enforcement agency, has still not issued any clear regulations on how they will enforce that exemption. Uh, I think it will be up to small companies just if they are asked, why did you file? They say, I didn't have to because I am I was a member of NSBA at that point. Um, but it's important also, because I, I take every opportunity to remind folks of this, and that is the, ex the the filing is by entity, not by business owner. So every single entity has to file. And it's only entities that were members of NSBA by March 1st, 2024, which are exempt. So a lot of entrepreneurs might have four or five, two or three, whatever, however many businesses, and maybe even some entities beneath that, that are not members of NSBA. Um, and so, uh, I just want to remind people that at every opportunity I get, because I don't want folks getting in uh, in trouble as a base based on that. Ultimately, though, and this is you know we're in a period of flux here for a year or two. Ultimately, our lawsuit is going to succeed, in which case the CTA will be thrown out altogether, and nobody has to report, or we will lose, and even our members will have to report. So the exemption, though though valuable uh, in the near term. It, is not a permanent uh, uh, unique fixture for members of an SBA. And we're also working hard, not just on the legal front, but on the legislative front to make sure that folks are covered as well. So um, we've, we've had a number of bills. We're up to six now that have been introduced across both chambers uh, of Congress. Um, one of them passed out of the House uh, last year on an overwhelming bipartisan uh, majority of the 421. Um, so we, we are expecting some consideration of this and that this will kind of continue to be on the forefront of things that members are considering. Um, we also have a little bit of a bright spot in that uh, Linda McMahon, who we were talking about briefly before, was the former SBA administrator, looks looks likely to potentially be the new Secretary of Commerce and has spent the, the last little bit of intervening time as chair of the America First Policy Institute, really, really closely aligned with um, the incoming, incoming Trump folks. Um, she recently has made comments supportive of our position and our, our opposition to the CPA. And so we, we right. do think that we will be right in there with key policymakers, uh, letting them know what the problems are and that we may be able to see some positive resolution to this, right. even if the court case doesn't play out the way we're hoping yeah. about. Because, I mean, even though um, the first Trump administration supported the inclusion of CTA and the defense authorization bill at the time when it, when it passed, um, uh, based on Ms. McMahon's comments, I we're hopeful that maybe we can get some juice to get them to change their position and, and support our position. So, I have one question. I mean, once you have, if, if you if the companies have to comply, which apparently they do by January of this coming year, you know, it's once you ring the bell, you can't unring the bell. Right. 
So that's the conundrum everybody's kind of in right now. I got to disclose silent partners that have no voting control or whatever that don't want to, their names to come out. Right. Uh, a lot of reasons why you want to disclose revenue um, um, for this purpose, at least. Right. So once it's out of the bag, you know, they, they accomplish what they wanted to anyway, except for those people who didn't, uh, didn't comply. To a degree, there's going to be mass non-compliance. However, we're fully expect because there's still, despite our best efforts and everyone else's, there's a there's huge lack of awareness of this in the small business community still. Um, especially because there's millions of small companies that aren't members of associations like this, right? They have no idea this is this is coming, um, and so there's going to be a mass uh, non non-compliance with the uh, with with the law uh, beginning January first. Um, and it is an issue. Uh, there is not a, a meaningful mechanism once you've submitted the data to sort of magically make it disappear and get erased from from uh, the, the the websites of the of FinCEN. The um, or I should say the databases of FinCEN, not the websites. We're not sure if they'll put it on the website or not. Um, but uh, the one the one benefit, however, is if uh, the data is submitted. Uh, and we win our lawsuit, the whole thing goes away or it gets delayed. Um, there will be no further need, obviously, to update it because that's 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 one of the major problems that we see. Also, is is the is the ongoing compliance, not just the initial filing. Uh, as things change, you've got to keep it updated um, in a very timely way, which is a, a huge problem as well. So that that at least would be lifted, even if folks choose to go ahead and file now. But for all these reasons and the pending court cases, that's why we've continued to encourage people to 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 not file until they have to. And uh, some folks I know want to get out of the way and they file early, um, uh, and you don't want to be caught um, with an inability to file at the very last minute. Uh, but we don't think it's there's no reason to file now when the real deadline is January first, um, even for folks who have to comply. Thank you, Todd and, and Reed, for your insights there, as well as Mike, for your perspectives. Um, we have a question along those lines, and I understand that you, Todd and, and Reed, briefly touched on it, but um, the, the question basically states, or asks rather, um, what opportunities do we have to advocate in front of the incoming Trump administration or uh, new congressional leadership around the CTA and perhaps uh, secure some sort of action that way? I mean, the first thing you can do is you can go onto our website right now to fill out an action alert. If you if you do that, that is right. the single fastest, best way you can get engaged on this. The more our members of Congress hear from us, wherever we are across the country, the more we get a groundswell on this. And we're going to be making sure that we in D.C. are, are reaching out constantly to folks in the administration, to folks on the Hill to kind of to, to push this and let them know. Um, as, as individual members, reach out to your member of Congress's office, fill out that action alert on our website, do, do all of those different things. And that is about the best thing you can do to help us out. Um, and beyond that, it, Todd, anything you want to add? Yeah, no, it's, there's no magic. It's, 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 it's getting in front of as many people as you can and, and making the case. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here. And that's what we need our members to do back at home, too. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then, Molly, I've got one additional question here. Um, and then I'll kick it back over to you. Um, okay. This member asks, how could the next administration affect or change current small business contracting policies? I mean, in, in, in lots of ways, both legislative and administratively, um, we've seen um, over the last decade or so, a significant decline in the number of small business federal contractors. Um, uh, we haven't necessarily seen a decline in the in the number of the amount of dollars flowing to small business contractors. It's just that they're being concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. Um, so it's it's very troubling. A lot of that has to do with the increasing complexity of being a, a, a contractor and the, and the various hurdles from from now cybersecurity and and, and all the rest. Uh, more and more contracts are are being uh, bundled again. Um, so. It's definitely a priority for us to figure out how to fix that. Um, but but so much of what happens in that federal marketplace is uh, governed through the regulatory process. While there's a lot that Congress can do to help, um, 
the the probably more than most areas the the real keys are in the hands of the of the president and the administration so and we can get their attention i think there's a lot that could be done uh, most of it relatively obscure but that means does mean it couldn't help uh, read anything else you want to add to that no, I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head there. Uh, the thing that we're going to keep pushing for is just an increase in uh, in, in set asides and, and in, in small business goaling um, and trying to make sure that we hold agencies accountable to actually meet those goals in a, in a real and sustainable way and make sure that they're not sort of meeting them through farming out and then subcontracting out, subcontracting out to large companies. So we're, we're keeping an eye on that and we're going to be talking with folks to make sure that um, small businesses are really getting a share of federal contracting dollars that they deserve. Great, thank you for those insights. And Molly, I'll kick it back to you with any final questions that you might have or additional insights there. Great, thanks Ian. Um, and thanks again everybody for joining us. Uh, we are recording this and we will send it out to everybody who registered. Um, so you'll have a copy of that after the fact. Uh, I've also put several different links in the chat um, to our Small Business Congress, to our Action Center. We encourage you to, to look there and get information. We've also put out um, some really great side-by-side -side, uh, on the, the new administration's regulatory stances, what we expect those to be. And then also follow us on the Weekly Advocate. We'll be putting out a, a really great article tomorrow that gets into a little bit more detail about uh, the, the Trump 2.0 and uh, what we expect the regulatory um, landscape to look like. So uh, make sure you follow us there, um, follow us on our socials. And uh, Todd and Rian, I really appreciate your time and your expertise and uh, talking through all this and Ian, your help with the questions. So uh, thanks everyone. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks everybody.